I have the, uh, the honor and the pleasure to introduce today's moderator. Truly, I could uh, talk about this wonderful professional newsman and person for the time set aside for this panel. The first host of Good Morning America, a job he held for 10 years, has moderated numerous panels for the Naval Institute and for AFSEA. As you will see, David Hartman does his homework required to deliver quality content with subject experts. David. Thank you, Fred. Afternoon, everybody. Uh, and to introduce uh, my panel. I'll be reasonably brief so that we can save as much time as possible to hear them talk about our relationship with China. Um, first, Admiral retired Tim Keating. He's a naval aviator, 5,000 hours of cockpit time in jets, uh, fighters, uh, some 1,200 carrier arrested landings, traps. Among his many commands, commander of 5th Fleet, commander of Kitty Hawk Battle Group, deputy director of ops on the joint staff at the Pentagon. He was simultaneously commander of NORAD and Northern Command. His last tour was three years as commander U.S. Forces Pacific, where he visited over 13 countries in the triple role as military, diplomatic, and commercial representative of our government, this is Admiral Tim Keating. Lieutenant General, retired Walter Gregson, Jr., Naval Academy graduate with two additional master's degrees to his credit. He's a Marine, combat experience in Vietnam and Somalia. Among his many commands, Commanding General, 3rd Marine Expeditionary Force, and Commander of Marine Forces in Japan, and Commander of Marine Forces Pacific. His last assignment in Washington was as Director, Asia and Pacific Affairs in the Office of the Under Secretary of Defense, and he currently has his own consulting company. And thirdly, uh, Ronald O'Rourke, he's a civilian, BA from Johns Hopkins, Phi Beta Kappa, MA in International Studies from the NHTSA School, also part of Hopkins. For some 25 years, he's been a naval analyst at the Congressional Research Service. He has written extensively about naval affairs and frequently briefs and testifies before members of Congress. He won the Naval Institute's Arleigh Burke essay contest and regularly presents naval issues to industry, uh, academia, and government. Uh, just a little background. Since the end of World War II, our country has had complicated relationships with both China and the Soviet Union, now the former Soviet Union. Uh, first, the Soviet Union, after being allies against Germany in the Axis in World War II, uh, the U.S.-Soviet relationship turned very sour. As Winston Churchill said eloquently in March of 1946 at Westminster College in Missouri with President Truman at his side, quote, an iron curtain descended on the continent from Stettin in the Baltic to Trieste in the Adriatic. The Cold War, of course, uh, continued unabated for some 40 years until Mikhail Gorbachev watched over, even promoted, the dissolution of the Soviet Union in the late 1980s and early 1990s. China, 1949, Mao won the Civil War in China, forcing Chiang Kai-shek and the nationalists to Taiwan, where they have remained ever since. The U.S., of course, continued to support Taiwan, uh, but in a stunning kind of geopolitical twist, uh, President Nixon visited China in the early 1970s, opened up a new relationship with the PRC to counter the Soviet's Cold War threat. And just a few years later, Deng Xiaoping in 1978 established what became known as China's new open door policy that has led to China's explosive, uh, extraordinary economic growth over the last 30 years. And China's is now the world's second largest economy. So what forces, if any, did the United States bring to bear on the Soviet Union to try to hasten the demise of the empire? And what forces might be at work today between the United States and China these forces are affecting both economic and military decisions for both of our countries. So that's where we start. Gentlemen, what did or didn't our country do to the Soviets in the 70s and 80s to help bring down the Soviet Union? Who wants to start? 
Right. Uh, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll start here. And I should note at the outset that these views are my own and not necessarily those of my employer. Uh, in my view, the United States brought to bear a variety of forces uh, in their effort against the Soviet Union during the Cold War. They were military, economic, political, diplomatic, ideological, and even cultural. Uh, in fact, you could do a whole conference just on uh, those things if you wanted to explore them in depth. And one might argue that uh, even though these efforts were not always as well coordinated as you might uh, want them to be, uh, they were what you might term today a whole of government effort, uh, even though the term wasn't invented at that time. And these efforts were carried out to implement an overarching strategy of containment that was articulated in the early years of the Cold War and then refined over succeeding years. And uh, in the military sphere, as part of our uh, uh, efforts uh, overall, we did a number of things. We formed alliances in Europe and Asia. We maintained a capable strategic nuclear deterrent. We used extended nuclear deterrence to protect our allies against Soviet attack. We shored up our ability over time to fight an extended conventional campaign in Europe, if need be. And in the final years, we presented the Soviet Union with the prospect of a competition in military spending and technology that might be difficult for them to sustain. And speaking as a naval analyst within that overall military effort, and then finally, uh, as the, uh, the last part of what I wanted to outline, uh, the Navy worked to ensure our ability to reinforce Central Europe in the event of a conflict. We protected the northern and southern flanks of NATO, as well as our allies in the Pacific. We threatened to use those sea areas as locations for projecting military power directly against the Soviet Union. And we used an articulated threat to go after their ballistic missile submarines in their bastions during a conventional conflict as a way to compel the Soviets to devote other naval assets to their protection, thereby helping to pin down the Soviet fleet in its home waters and make it harder for the Soviet Navy to break out into broader ocean areas where it would have been a lot harder for us to counter. Uh, so that's how I would uh, start broadly and then narrow it down. So we did put pressure on the Soviets. In a variety of ways, right. and not just military, but military was a part of it. General, I'm going to take a shot. Yeah, let me go a little bit to some of the differences uh, with uh, the situation then and the situation now. Uh, shortly after the collapse of the Soviet Union, the then chairman of the Joint Chiefs, General Colin Powell, asked his staff, what do you do when you lose your best enemy? And in many ways, we're still looking for what we do since we lost our best enemy. The Soviet Union was right out of central casting as a designated enemy of the United States. They, they aggressively championed the spread of a competing ideology. They oppressed not only their own citizens, but they oppressed citizens of other nations that they moved into. They had a command-directed economy that really wasn't an economy of all, at all and they presented massive, robust forces, land, air, and later sea, to us as a direct threat to us and our allies. They gave us all the rationale that we needed to form the alliance system that Mr. O'Rourke talked about. They formed the exact template during an era of linear projection or increases in technology, they gave us the exact template for Secretary McNamara's planning, programming, and budgeting system in that this year's technology was slightly better than last year's, next year's airplane was going to be slightly faster, better, and more expensive than this year's airplane, that type of thing. The Soviet Union made it easy for us to assume the role of the city on the hill to be the champion to many nations in the rest of the world for freedom, uh, for a economic system, for representative government, all those types of things. China presents a much different problem. None of our friends in Asia want us to pick a fight with China. All of our friends in Asia want us to handle this relationship in a mature manner, and all of our friends in Asia want us to represent what we stand for in a logical manner. Freedom of the seas, freedom of navigation, freedom of access to the domains of cyber, air, space, those types of things, but they want us to do it in a manner that assures peace, stability, and prosperity. Millions in Asia rose out of poverty to a much better life in many ways 
thanks to the economic development of China, and that's not something that the Soviet Union was able to say. So we have an entirely different relationship here, in my opinion, than we did with the Soviet Union in trying to apply the template of containment, all those other things that we did with the Soviet Union to our dealings with China is just not possible. I'm a kid. Thanks, David. It occurs to me that for the first 20 years of most of our adult professional lives, we sweat Russia, we sweat the Soviet Union. We, in the Navy, we, we did recognition drills of Russian ships. We worried about their submarines. They were a true blue water Navy. Uh, they could be found anywhere we were going. Uh, they had significant capability and capacity. Uh, that changed, of course, and now, uh, particularly in the Asia-Pacific region, Russia is an afterthought. Uh, on the other hand, China is, of course, anything but. We as, a, we as people uh, who have come from other countries here, I think we wake up in the morning and if somebody says, which way is Russia, we point east. Well, that, that's partly correct, and we look through Europe to look at, at Russia. Which way is China? We look west. So it's a profound, almost theological difference between those two countries. We prevail in the case of the Soviet Union for reasons that have been well explained. The situation with China is, as I say, much different. Uh, I was able to visit there twice. The chip's been a couple times, I'm sure, and uh, not to correct David, but to, to amplify, we went to almost 30 countries in the Asia Pacific, some of them a dozen times, uh, and in, in each and every visit, not just in the military side, but in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Commerce, and, and uh, uh, civilian think tanks, those countries look to us as their indispensable partner. Now they don't want, they, those countries in the Asia Pacific region, don't want us there in force all the time, they just assume many of them not have land forces permanently stationed, so it, it tends to recommend a mobile, flexible force um, in being from the United States. But all those countries want us around, they want to exercise with us, they want to train with us, because they want us as a hedge against China. China likes us to be around because they view us as a hedge against adventurism by the part of some countries. And when you ask Chinese uh, military officials and diplomats, what is it that you are about in your country these days, the more candid we'll say in a sidebar conversation or the Chardonnay dialogue, uh, as some call it, we just want to protect that which is ours, which is eminently understandable to us in the United States. Regime survival is of surpassing importance to China's leaders, and when you run through the list of things that would be a concern to China's leaders, I don't think military adventurism is at the top or even top 10 of their list. When you think about regime survival, environment, energy, economy, economics, graft and corruption, education, demographics, all of those factors are of greater to much greater concern to China's leaders. So the difference between Russia and China, dramatic difference even when we were thinking of the, of the Soviet Union, today there are wonderful opportunities for us resident all throughout the Asia Pacific region, and I think our country is relatively well positioned to capitalize on those opportunities. But it's a, it's a train we can't miss. Just, just to add quickly that I agree that, uh, in my own view, I think the differences uh, loom larger than the similarities, and that therefore this is not a situation of taking an old template and simply trying to reapply it in a modern context. The Soviet Union's goals were quite different structurally than what we perceive China's goals to be. Uh, there was nothing in the Cold War uh, situation with the Soviet Union that quite matches the situation with Taiwan. Most of the countries in Europe during the Cold War uh, were locked into one alliance structure or another, or were formally neutral, and therefore uh, their policies were uh, uh, set uh, in place, whereas the political futures of a number of the countries in the Pacific Basin are still uh, open for those people to decide in terms of their own futures. And unlike uh, the situation with the Soviets, we have huge and growing uh, economic ties uh, with China. It's another basic fundamental difference. So, so to I what tend extent, to so to what extent what we, we have a symbiotic this. relationship on one hand and a potentially competitive relationship on the other? Well, we have, we have both. Uh, the meetings going on in Washington while we're blessedly down here, this, the strategic <laughs> and economic dialogue uh, brings together uh, officials, high officials from all the different agencies of both of our governments. 
it's a classic case of having matters where we agree and where we can uh, make forward progress with the Chinese and matters where we have profound disagreements. Uh, you may have seen the uh, news clips of Secretary Clinton and Vice President Biden just recently uh, talking about human rights. And President Bi uh, Vice President Biden put it well, I thought, when uh, somebody questioned him about having this type of dialogue with the Chinese. He said that you cannot have a genuine dialogue unless you talk about areas where you have profound disagreements. So it's that type of a dialogue. We have both relationships. We have matters where we agree, where we should move forward to make progress for all the right reasons. We have other areas where we have to be quite clear, in my opinion, where we stand and what our beliefs are. Human rights is one, and another one that is a very nettlesome matter between China and the United States is territorial is the, is the limit of territorial seas. China likes a 200 nautical mile limit, and we hold with the international standard, which of course helps us to guarantee freedom of navigation uh, in the Western Pacific. The uh, issue uh, with the Chinese about what's theirs and what's ours is of surpassing importance. And as Chip just said, that they have a, they profess, they embrace, they advocate, they advertise a much different position than we observe. But at the end of the day, I think they understand that there is this international collegium that respects certain well-established, well-defined, long-term limits to maritime and air uh, power uh, in particular. The Chinese continually harangue us during visits, or when we're not visiting but we're still talking to them, about the, quote, spy flights that we conduct up and down in international airspace and uh, international water off our coast perfectly within every limit that the established UN Conventional Law of the Sea, and why don't we hurry up and ratify it, and uh, the United Nations uh, strips, uh, it bugs the Chinese to a great extent. But when you go back to the Chinese and say, well, the, when they say, you know, what would you do if, if we did that to you? And you say, well, nothing. You, you, well, the Russians do it. You know, they fly up along, while at Northern Command and NORAD, we, we, we pay very close attention to the Russians flying along the Alaskan and Canadian uh, Air littoral. Uh, so what? But the Chinese have a different notion that they advocate, that they advertise. Uh, they're much different and much more um, non-confrontational when you can get them off to the side and get them off the stage. Right. What both of these comments point out is the fact that China's interpretation of its rights under international law to regulate foreign military activities in its EEZ, extending out to 200 miles, is quite different than ours. China belongs to a minority of countries uh, among the world community, about two or three dozen communities, that asserts that under international law, uh, coastal nations have the right to regulate not only economic activities within their EEZ, but foreign military activities as well. And that is a fundamental difference between China and uh, the two or three dozen other countries that hold that point of view, and the United States and its allies, and the vast majority of the other world governments. And it's important to point this out because this is on top of and in parallel to the issues of the maritime territorial claims that have caused uh, so much tension in this area over the last 12 to 18 months. Because you could even resolve all of those claims fully among all the nations of that area, and the remaining independent difference of opinion on this legal question about what the coastal states rights are concerning the ability to regulate foreign military activities in one's own EEZ would still remain because China would still apply that theory to the EEZ that derives off of its own coastline independent of what happens in the South China Sea. And this is a difference of opinion that appears to be at the crux of the incidents between U.S. military uh, air, uh, 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 ships and Chinese uh, ships and aircraft that have taken place on multiple occasions, both in 2001 and in 2009. It's a difference of opinion that has led to incidents in international waters and airspace, and it's something that we have to uh, track carefully and manage carefully and make our own views uh, crystal clear, because it, uh, in addition to creating the potential for incidents in that region, depending on what happens with the treatment of that issue, it could set a legal precedent that could complicate 
our operations in other parts of the world as well if that became, if China's view on this issue became the more dominant view among the nations of the world. To what extent do the Chinese share with us in any way their kind of um, long-term strategies, their <laughs> goals, uh, whether it be military, economic, political, how much do they share or not, and what effect does that have on our decision-making process? Uh, not to be clear, they don't. Um, <laughs> at least in my experience, uh, Chip uh, and Ron both are, are in a little more, uh, tend to be in the more strategic realm, but in kind of tactical operational world uh, where I've lived for a couple years, um, in dealing with Chinese military officials, they're, they're the church of what's happening now. I mean, it's, it's what's happening today, what, what do we think is gonna happen tomorrow, and they're just looking to hang on to their jobs. Now, that's, that's a little overstated, but uh, um, I, we would challenge them on a couple of occasions, try, and some folks say you, you're not being sufficiently transparent, you, the Chinese military in particular, Chinese government at large. And we didn't think that that was quite the right way to couch it. Um, Jim Shin, who was uh, uh, Chip's predecessor, had a way of characterizing as, we can see what you're doing, so transparency isn't the issue. We see you have X-60-some submarines, and you've got uh, ships out in the Gulf of Aden, uh, a blue water capability, not necessarily and you have a Virag, the old Virag Russian uh, carrier that you're converting. So transparency was the problem. It was intention. Why do you, what do you intend to do with these capabilities that you're developing? Not to mention long range uh, surface, surface and air surface missiles. And they were very inscrutable at that point, the, the Chinese military leaders. They, because I'm not so sure that they have a fitted or a five year plan or a national security strategy. They'll publish their white book, but it, it is conspicuously uh, devoid of any long-term strategy. So, long answer, a short question. Uh, when challenged or confronted, or at least when the issue is addressed, the Chinese military answers were generally unsatisfactory. So to what extent, therefore, uh, does the element of possible, or of, does, of mistrust come into the process? And if we're, if we don't trust them, then how, to what extent could that lead to some kind of a tinderbox situation where something's gonna flare, yeah. which could have been avoided? Uh, well, I think that that's a concern on the U.S. side that has been expressed by our own officials, and that's one reason why uh, uh, various officials in the executive branch, from Secretary Gates on down, have expressed a desire to uh, make the military-to-military -military relationship uh, with the Chinese more stable and more permanent and something that uh, doesn't happen only during times of lesser tension because it's in times of higher tension that you most need to uh, call on that relationship to keep things from getting out of hand. So it's something that executive branch officials uh, any number of times have stated that they would wish would be uh, put onto a more stable uh, and sustainable uh, basis than, rather than the off and on nature of these communications uh, that has occurred mostly because of China's decisions to periodically turn it off and then restore it at a later point. I would concur with all this and add that it's not just in the military sphere. There's, uh, there's significant distrust in the private sector of the actions of Chinese corporations, too. Let me, let me pile sure. on, David. You know, all of us are carrying these things around now that the, some personal communication device during two formal visits to China, separated by about a year and a half, uh, interrupted by the on again, off again, cessation of military, military, sanctioned military visits, and, and the near half dozen visits where we would run into China, senior Chinese military officials. I, I, the, the mantra would, repeated every chance I had, please give me your cell phone number. Please give me the phone number to your office. So that in the event of a South China Sea, USNS invincible Chinese Coast Guard, bump or worse, someone's hurt, worst of all, there's a fatality. We can take confusion, we don't want it to lead to crisis, much less confrontation, much less conflict, so try and work that back. And how many times do we dispel confusion by picking up the phone and calling David Hartman saying, I heard you said Pete Rose should be in the Hall of Fame. Did you really say that? And, and we can either, we can clear it up and decide to disagree, but at least we, I know how to get a hold of you. 
in three years, I never got one phone number, cell phone. I could see him carrying them around, or one office telephone number. Now, there is the Beijing-Washington hotline. I was able to use it twice, but it's a misnomer. It's not hot. It took 45 minutes to get, it, to get the call through. And uh, the, the, by then, it's almost after the fact. So this notion of distrust, it's simmering. It occasionally flares. It could be dissipated significantly by more frequent and almost pedestrian communication. They are reluctant to do so. I think it's also worth mentioning that uh, mistrust or lack of communication is not necessarily always the cause of these accidents. These incidents at sea may have been provoked by deliberate decisions on the part of the Chinese government to have their forces behave uh, in a certain way in proximity to ours. So you can even make that call sometimes and not have a satisfactory discussion if you reach somebody at okay, the Okay, so end what, of the what line. are they doing? What these incidents that have popped up, whether it's fishing boats or the Korean submarine, you know, the Korean ship blowing up, Spratleys, some of these fishing boat incidents. What are they doing? Well, some of it is to assert and defend their maritime territorial claims, and some of it is to assert and defend their interpretation of their legal rights as they view them to regulate foreign military activities within their EEZ. And, uh, and part of the reason I am emphasizing this in my comments is to highlight the fact that this is a, a separate and parallel issue that would remain even if the territorial maritime territorial disputes went away entirely. And it's the one actually that puts us potentially more at risk of getting involved in an incident of some kind with China than the maritime territorial claims themselves, which are things that are more likely to lead to incidents between China and other countries in that region. We're reading about the fact that the Chinese military is building up. Describe, uh, would you, what, what are they doing? What are they building and for what purposes as far as you know? It's a great question, and I think it's a tough question. Uh, it goes to what our points we just made a little bit ago, David. Um, they, they, aircraft carriers, they have a stealth airplane. The, uh, you know, there was much commotion made over the fact that they, they, the Chinese, rolled it out on the day that Secretary Gates was there. I, you know, th th it was not a surprise to the Secretary of Defense that the Chinese had this platform. Um, Although it's seems to have been a surprise to the president of China, but go it ahead. It may very well have been, which is an interesting point. There are folks who, who, who believe that the Chinese, senior Chinese military officials have all of a sudden learned about the media. And they were kept in pretty, you know, they had choke collars on until about two years ago, and, and they either found a way to take the collar off or the, or the tension was relaxed on the choke, and now you see Chinese four stars making statements that show up in the press. And so they're feeling a little muscular. And to Ron's point, it is entirely possible that some of these activities we see being conducted by the Chinese military are not just um, tacitly approved, but actually encouraged by Chinese civilian leaders. Uh, a Chinese admiral, we talked about this in Pensacola a little bit, um, he pulled me aside and said, "Hey, how, how about let's make a deal? You know, he says to me, we're building an aircraft carrier, wink, wink. We were, again, not unaware. <laughs> and he said, how about if I, you and I strike a deal right now? We'll cut the Pacific in half. You take everything east of Hawaii. You can go wherever you want, do whatever you want with all your carriers and all your ships. We'll take west of Hawaii. And we'll do it. Anything happens out here, we'll let you know. Anything happens over here, you let us know. And I, I declined his gracious offer. But then, then he went on to say... Guam was happy that you did. Guam was happy, and Japan probably too. Um, he went on to say, very candidly, he, he started whispering, they have done some analysis, and in their view, the, most, the singular most potent symbol of national sovereignty and reach and power and presence is an aircraft carrier coming into a foreign port, flight deck bristling with jets, and a country's national engine waving from the signal bridge. So he said, we're going to have aircraft carriers because we don't want you to think that you have complete control over all the Asia Pacific. Yeah, to, to build on, on the Admiral's answer, China has been engaged in a military modernization effort uh, since some point in the 1990s. The exact point differs depending on which observer uh, uh, you're listening to. Uh, but in the maritime area, it's a broad-based effort that includes surface ships and submarines and aircraft and 
cruise missiles and this new anti-ship ballistic missile, mines. It includes uh, reforms in personnel uh, quality and training and education and in logistics. It's not just any one thing, although typically only one thing captures the imagination of the press at any one point. At some time ago, it was uh, their submarine modernization effort, and then that was followed by, most recently, over the uh, change of the year, by uh, uh, the anti-ship ballistic missile. And now, most recently, a lot of people have uh, focused on the aircraft carrier because uh, uh, the sea trials of that carrier are now viewed as, as being eminent, as taking place sometime later this year. So at any one point in time, the press attention might be focused on only one element of this modernization effort, or maybe two, uh, but when you look at the whole of uh, their efforts in this area, it is a broad-based effort that includes a lot of different acquisition programs and a lot of other reforms of their military. Now, that's not to say they're 10 feet tall or even 6 feet tall but they're a lot better than they were, and they're on, they're on their way to getting better still in the years ahead. Admiral Mullen was quoted as saying recently that rather than being just curious about it, he's now concerned about, unquote, about that. General, how concerned should the United States be about what Ron just described? Now, it's, it's certainly a matter that, uh, that requires attention. Uh, unstated in the uh, comments about the buildup are that China is adding an awful lot of land-based rockets and missiles to their arsenal to, uh, in some people's opinion, use the land to control the sea. Uh, the DF-21 promises an awful lot of capability. Uh, what is that? That's the anti-ship ballistic missile. Uh, uh, it remains to be seen whether it achieves the uh, stated capability when it's actually fielded. Uh, in many ways, this is an answer to the U.S. Navy's introduction of the Tomahawk missile and the Aegis system, which uh, took the surface Navy from a position of uh, challenge status to uh, a very, very powerful land attack uh, strike platform and a way to, uh, to protect the aircraft carriers. Uh, it's a back and forth. Uh, seaborne capability to affect uh, the land, land capability to affect uh, the sea, uh, area denial, anti-access, as the United States has termed it. Uh, it's a matter that needs attention, and, uh, and I'm sure it's getting it. So how should the United States respond if we're looking 10, again, I'm looking long term, 10, 20, 30 years down the road, if this expansion on their part militarily, or the missile you talk about, uh, continues to develop or be developed? How should our country respond? Well, we need to respond with a comprehensive set of capabilities, not just technology, but tactics, techniques, procedures, allied capability, all these other things to make sure that we have the ability to continue to operate in the Pacific and in the Indian Ocean and in other areas as we, uh, as we intend to operate. And it's not important to do that solely because you think you might fight a war with China. A lot of people think that that war is very, very unlikely because of the huge economic ties between the two countries and the tremendous damage that that kind of conflict would produce. It's important in addition, or perhaps even principally, because you think that war is not going to happen. For one thing, being prepared uh, uh, to fight that war and to uh, counter those uh, Chinese systems is one of the reasons why the war doesn't happen in the first place, because you've shown that and you're deterring it. But more importantly, in all the days when the war is not happening, all the other countries of the Pacific Basin are taking their measure of that military balance between the United States and China, and they are factoring it into their own decisions about their own future uh, uh, policies and whether to align them more closely with us or perhaps more closely with China. And so the ability to show that you're prepared to fight that conflict is important not only to prevent it, but also to help shape the political evolution of the Pacific Basin in all the days when the war is not happening. That's a real structural difference between the situation in the Pacific today and the situation in Europe during the Cold War. Because as I mentioned earlier, in the Cold War, most of the countries in Europe had their political futures already locked into place one way or the other. They were members of NATO or the Warsaw Pact, or they were formerly neutral countries. But there are a number of countries in the Pacific Basin that have not made lasting or permanent or ultimate choices about their own political futures. And as they go through that process of deciding which way they want to go in the future, uh, they are, among other things, taking exquisite and very careful measurement of the military balance on an ongoing basis between the United States and China. 
So it's important, I think, to show that you can counter these anti-access area denial forces that China is uh, producing and fielding, not only because of the contingency of a war that may be very, very unlikely, but because of the situation that obtains in the absence of that war. So pile on to that with, with one more point. Weapons capabilities migrate also, so it's important to be able to counter new technologies, not just because one country may have it, but because it'll move. You'll recall some time ago, Hezbollah shocked the Israelis with an anti-ship cruise missile that struck one of their vessels off the coast of Lebanon. This, this was a heretofore unexpected capability from that group. What should our government do now and years to come to assure that we are with all of our allies in the area in every way to make sure that they stay in our sphere and they don't tilt toward China, despite the possible economic benefits of doing that for them. Uh, very quickly, just to get the discussion on that started, three things. One is we have to field the forces and the technologies and the capabilities that had have the ability to counter those anti-access and area denial forces. Secondly, many people say we have to make sure that we maintain a presence in that region. Uh, that is visible to the countries in the region and is uh, not just a token presence, but one that has combat credibility, is large enough and capable enough so that it engenders confidence among the observers in these third party countries in the Pacific Basin uh, that we can in fact uh, conduct combat operations effectively if we are ever called upon to do so. And the third thing, which in, in my view until recently has been perhaps a little bit lagging, is expressions of confidence on the part of American officials that we can, in fact, counter what China is doing. China has, I think, had a little bit of a free run in the press with some of their military developments, including most recently their anti-ship ballistic missile. And some of the gee whiz reporting on that missile, I think, has been a little bit over the top. And there's been an, an implicit assumption, in my view, written into some of this reporting that because this is a new and novel weapon, a so-called game changer, it must therefore be invincible. And that's just nonsense. It is a new weapon, but that doesn't mean it can't be countered. There are any number of ways you can imagine to counter it, and I imagine our Navy is working on those things right now. But it's important to express publicly your confidence in your ability to counter weapons like that, because the other countries in that region are looking for those expressions of confidence. If they don't see it, they can pick up an element of demoralization or discouragement. And perhaps even more important, you have to express that confidence back to China. Because having an ability to counter somebody else's weapon, but not saying so publicly, can actually be destabilizing. Because it can encourage uh, overconfidence and miscalculation on the part of that other country. And so the third element of actually saying that you're doing these things, and that you are confident in your current and future ability to counter these weapons, I think is important. And we're beginning now, I think within the last several months, to see expressions like that on the part of US naval and other military leaders. But until a few months ago, I think uh, uh, examples of those kinds of expressions were a little bit lacking. There's another aspect to this too, and besides having a robust, combat capable forward presence. That presence has to be productive during times when the master arming switch is off. We need to be widely distributed, operationally resilient, and politically sustainable in the current mantra that's, uh, that's been developed over the last couple of years. Why? Because all of our friends out there want us to be there to represent the United States, to represent what we believe in. And believe you me, China is actively working every area out there. The uh, infrastructure that they're building in places like Bangladesh, in Burma, and other places are one aspect of their uh, uh, program. Cambodia is another one, and to use an anecdote to illustrate, uh, the Cambodians frequently told us a few years ago that we really want to be friends with you, but you folks are never here. We need infrastructure. The Chinese are building the infrastructure. Uh, if you consider the uh, Admiral Keating's anecdote a few moments ago about dividing the Pacific with the Chinese taking everything west of Hawaii, there's this great flyover country between Hawaii and the Asian littoral that, co that uh, contains a number of Pacific Island nations. And in each one of these Pacific Island nations, the Chinese 
economic soft power presence is there. Uh, in many places, they call themselves the People's Republic of China Chamber of Commerce, although, as you know, that those terms don't really fit together. But the issue is that unless we're there with some frequency, we're ceding the territory to the Chinese. Um, some years ago, another anecdote that's stepping into my good friend Admiral Keating's lane, some years ago, in the nation of Kuribati, which we used to refer to as the Gilbert Islands, which we used to refer to more specifically as Tarawa, there, the Chinese put up a phased array radar system that was bore sighting our ballistic missile range at Kwajalein Island. Kuribati has now changed their uh, recognition. They now recognize Taiwan, so the phased array radar is gone. But the anecdote I still think is illustrative for our need to be there. Now, we're there with other programs. Millennium Challenge, the program to uh, uh, build infrastructure with the aid of the locals, is one of the real American branded things that we need to do. Besides the State Department presence, besides our economic presence, we need the military presence at some frequency to engage in capacity building, to help local governments, to do all those things that we stand for so we can reassume the city on the hill posture that was so effective uh, in a different context some years earlier. To ignore these places is to allow, is to cede the area when we don't need to. A couple of specific areas. North Korea. How does, how does China see our consideration at this moment of North Korea? Let me take this one. You know more about it than <laughs> North Korea, North Korea is a problem for, for all of us for, for the obvious reasons. Uh, China fears, we think, China fears instability in North Korea above all else. We think that this helps to explain the many ways where China, in effect, looks to us like they're acting like North Korea's defense attorney when North Korea does egregious acts like the sinking of the Chunin or the shelling of Waipido Island. Uh, in return, we have tried to make very clear that unless we can constrain North Korea's development uh, in the nuclear area, North Korea's missile development, North Korean provocations, that we will take action to reinforce our alliance capabilities with both the Republic of Korea and Japan. Uh, China may or may not find increased United States presence in that area uh, in their interest or not in their interest, but North Korea has achieved a very clever power of extortion over South Korea with the 900-some uh, artillery systems that can range Seoul. They have some extortion leverage over Japan with their nuclear program and their missile program, and they have some extortion power over China with uh, China's fear of massive numbers of North Korean refugees coming into Manchuria, which has a problem of its own with being able to feed the population in Manchuria before the, uh, before the additional refugees are added. Uh, but this also raises the, the issue, uh, to build on, on that answer, of stability and instability and, and who's doing what. Uh, as the general mentioned, China does not want to see an unstable situation uh, in North Korea because of what might happen after that. On the other hand, North Korea is a source of instability to the region, and to the degree that uh, China, as it was said, acts as North Korea's uh, lawyer or protector, uh, they uh, uh, are getting into a situation where they are, in effect, backstopping a source of instability in the region. And so, uh, if China were to come to us and say, uh, well, we in China are concerned about the prospect of instability on the Korean Peninsula and in North Korea, uh, uh, by the same token, I think, uh, it would make sense to hear from their U.S. interlocutors our own view that because North Korea itself is a source of instability uh, in the Western Pacific, uh, their support of that country is helping to perpetuate uh, a source of instability that uh, can uh, lead to any number of dangerous situations. Is there anything we can do now about this? I mean, as a government, can we raise our hand and say, let's do ABC to make this a more stable situation? Anything? Again, it's Chip's Lane encouraging uh, reinitiation of the six-party talks. Um, it's one of those things that almost nothing bad can happen if you're sitting around a table talking with uh, professional colleagues. And that's 
a lot more your lane. Our position at the moment is that North Korea has to come to some kind of understanding with South Korea before any other talks occur. Uh, we couple that with the fact that uh, once there's some kind of agreement across the DMZ, then we are willing to talk to North Korea in a, quote, international context, unquote, meaning uh, six-party talks. Um, one of the interesting tendencies, in, in my opinion, is in the United States, we look at uh, solving North Korea as something the United States has to do. Uh, there may be a different angle. We may accept North Korea, the North Korean situation for being as challenging as it is, and the fact that there's many parts of this that we can influence but not control, and consider what's important. In my opinion, what's important is that whatever North Korea does, we ensure in the aftermath of some North Korean act that it reinforces our alliance relationships with the Republic of Korea and Japan and doesn't allow North Korea to start driving wedges between the policy objectives of South Korea, Japan, and the United States. Uh, in that sense, I think the stronger we make our alliances with South Korea and Japan, the more influence we accrue to eventually be able to control things over uh, North Korea. One interesting thing out of the recent North Korean provocations was to show how these things can work, is that after the sinking of the Chunin, the political atmosphere within a critical cohort of the South Korean electorate did not change their opinion about North Korea very much. After the artillery attack on Waipido Island, that cohort fundamentally shifted to it's North Korea's fault, South Korea is the aggrieved party, it's their fault, it's not South Korea's part, which gave President Lee Moon-bak tremendous political capital to pursue the negotiation strategy with North Korea that he's pursuing now. In my opinion, this is a good thing so far, it remains to be seen how this turns out, but uh, uh, it's that type of thing that, um, that I was alluding to when I said we have to make sure that whatever North Korea does, that it strengthens our alliance relationships and does not cause uh, divergence or splits in our alliances. Admiral Keating, how likely that uh, there's going to be a, a, an attack by China on Taiwan? Where is that going to go, do you think? Uh, each day, it's less likely than it was the day before, David. Uh, to be sure, China has, numbers are uncertain, but we had a pretty good feel for it, 1,200 to 1,500 surface-to-surface surface missiles uh, along their coast uh, pointed at Taiwan or close to Taiwan. Uh, Any time you visit a Chinese, senior Chinese official, you'll get the Taiwan homily. Uh, literally got to the point where we'd stop and say, you know, I'll give you, I'll give you the speech, thanks. And, and, and some of them say, yeah, I know, okay, well, we'll just, we'll save ourselves 10 minutes and not drag you through it. But it is a core national interest for the People's Republic of China. Uh, if you visit Taiwan, uh, if you have the privilege of visiting Taiwan, uh, it is a bustling, thriving nation. Uh, and there are now cross-strait commercial traffics of, in the hundreds, where uh, uh, two years ago, I guess, there were almost none. Um, the economic ties that bind are very, very strong across the straits. There are social, uh, activities ongoing that were nearly unthinkable five years ago, uh, Chinese and Marian Taiwans and vice versa. Uh, so there are family bonds, there are economic ties, there are commercial ties, and, and fairly simple things like exchanging exotic animals, pandas to Taiwan and, uh, and similar such things, uh, all recommend a gradual solution. It may be some young man in this audience or a young woman at a war college who's formulating the structure that will allow China and Taiwan to one government, two countries, two cities, uh, some sort of confederation, whatever the structure and solution, it's coming and the day is sooner than later. Uh, how much, um, so much of our focus as a nation has been, as you mentioned, one of you mentioned earlier, Euro. Yeah, David, I'm sorry, there's one, Go. please don't lose that train of thought. Go back. Go. We will hasten that eventual solution by remaining strong. It goes to Chip's point and Ross' point. We have got to stay 
in the Western Pacific with real presence. Virtual presence equals actual absence, according to JOs in the crowd. So it, nothing substitutes for an Arleigh Burke or uh, the 31st Mu visiting. We have got to stay there and demonstrate our willingness, our durability, and that presence will help hasten the eventual dissolution of the tension that exists across the street. How concerned are all three of us with all the budget challenges right now that what you just said needs to happen may not happen to the extent that you say it needs to be done? Well, um, while I had the privilege of uh, living in Hawaii, Wandley and I, we were um, cautioned about expressing a lack of support for certain very high-end platforms, service not specific, but there were a couple that came to mind. And, and we were advocating for more early Burks and more F-18s and more F-15s and more F-16s. You know, we, we've got a large number of, very, we in the United States have, a, in my view, a sufficient number of the ultra high technological platforms. We just needed numbers. We've got the sufficient quality, we need the quantity. And so uh, the decision to keep building e, uh, Hornet EFs, I don't guess we're gonna get much more in the F-16, F-15 world, but there's a point at which the service doesn't so much matter. It's the capability to, to, to be present and to get volume that is of great importance in the Asia Pacific region, mostly because of its size, also because of the enduring nature of the relationships we enjoy, the relationships we enjoy and have worked hard to maintain, but you gotta be there. Just to sort of build on that, right now in Washington and around the country, there is a fairly wide-ranging debate going underway about the future of the federal budget, and within that, about the future uh, defense budget, uh, the defense top line, as it's called. And there's a lot of uncertainty about exactly where the defense budget may go. Most people tend to say that the high-end scenario for the defense budget would be for the budget in real terms to remain uh, about where it is right now, or perhaps go up a tiny bit. Other people have advocated very steep reductions in defense spending on the order of as much as $100 billion per year, which would be about a one-sixth reduction in the size of the defense budget. So there's a very big wedge of possibility about where the defense budget may go in the future. The defense budget stays about flat in real terms, and the Navy's share of that stays about where it is, then at least for the Navy, which is what I can speak uh, about, uh, the Navy will be able, it seems, to implement their current program of record without too many changes or cutbacks, because that program of record does assume little or no real growth in the Navy's budget. If the defense budget, however, goes down in real terms by some amount, then a second variable will kick in, and that's the argument about how you should apportion uh, that declining defense budget. And there are people who are making an argument based on considerations of China that perhaps the Navy and to some degree the Air Force should have a greater share of the DOD budget in coming years as the nation pivots itself strategically away from the concerns of the last decade of Iraq and Afghanistan and Central Asia and increasingly toward the Pacific. That's the argument they're making about what should happen. That argument has gained some traction, I think, over the last a year or year and a half, in part because of uh, the tensions over uh, China's maritime territorial disputes and, and how that has led to incidents, whether that argument has gained enough traction or will continue to gain more traction so that it is enough to begin shifting budget shares in DOD enough so that even if the budget as a whole goes down, the Navy's budget might not be impacted that much, that's an open question at this point. But if the DOD budget goes down and the Navy's share of that budget does not rise in any substantial way, then the Navy will be looking at the need to probably make uh, more substantial cutbacks in its program of record affecting the quantities of these platforms and systems that the Admiral talked about. I left uh, the government on 1 April, April Fool's Day. I thought it was appropriate personally, but the, the, so far at that point when I left the government, the, the, the recommendation, the decision was that we would maintain our presence in the Pacific. We will be probably drawing down elsewhere if drawdowns are to be made, but as far as a priority with the shift of economic power to Asia, all these other things, the decision uh, at this point or at least the point when I left the building, was to maintain our, our power in the Pacific. With that, 
we need to make sure that we, as I mentioned earlier, use that presence in the most productive way possible, besides widely distributing our forces to do things in a number of different places simultaneously. And think of the model in Afghanistan or in Iraq, where we have very small units, very far from their parent organization, in very dangerous territory, working by themselves just fine. If we can do that in a combat zone, we can certainly do that within Asia. We can leverage non-traditional deployment means in addition to the uh, traditional deployment means we may have out there to move forces around the area. And most importantly, we can leverage our allied and our partner relationships with many nations out there to, in essence, build capacity within our allies and partners as well as building capacity in the areas that might be more challenged. Uh, it's one thing to have the presence out there, it's another thing, and I think we're gonna be, have to increasingly do this in the future, is find more innovative and ingenious ways to leverage our allies and friends and to leverage the forces we do have out there to be productive rather than sitting around the base camp work, uh, waiting for somebody to put the master arming switch on. One uh, just very specific question about Navy. Some critics of Navy say we can do with 10 uh, carrier strike groups, not 11, get rid of one. How much sense would that make, not only for the Navy, but geopolitically? Um, 11's better than 10, 10's okay. I, I, I read, I've been around when there were 15 and it just makes Navy's challenges and opportunities uh, easier to fulfill, to satisfy. Right. Right. I think it's inevitable that uh, the number will, I think 10's, 10's the, the bottom line, 11, we maybe get back up to 12, but I don't see it being, it's in that window. The, the, num the number of carriers has been debated uh, on and off uh, for decades. It's uh, an abiding question in Naval force planning. And in the current budgetary environment, where people are looking at scenarios of the Navy's budget uh, coming under greater pressure, it is natural for people to propose that as one of the ways of living within a lower Navy top line. I think it is worth mentioning, however, that it's not axiomatic that if the Navy's budget goes down, the number of carriers has to go down. There are plenty of other places to think about reducing Navy force structure. And there have been Navy officials in the past at a time when there were 12 carriers in the Navy who said that the last 12 ships the Navy will get rid of are the carriers. So they're just stating, stating that as an extreme to make the point. But I think when you are contemplating uh, a, a scenario of a reduced Navy budget, it's not necessarily the case that you should look first or only at reducing the number of carriers, because there's plenty of other places to take programmatic reductions in the Navy. You know, we've said earlier, and we've said for decades, we're so Eurocentric. But with all the attention our country pays, obviously Middle East, Near East, now North Africa, Mediterranean, and so forth, how important is it for our nation to turn more of its focus, more of its attention, day in and day out, to Asia? It is no, of surpassing importance. And it, it's, it has to happen. And frankly, it's not an either or. Uh, the. Uh, it's been widely alleged that uh, we were in a good place in Afghanistan early on, then we took our eyes off of that, focused on Iraq, and then uh, we let Afghanistan get away from us. Maybe true, maybe not. Uh, but th those two examples point out that, that you have to, uh, there has to be a broad view here. Uh, we can't, con can't over-concentrate. I'm an Asia-file but I will say that you can't over-concentrate on Asia to the detriment of everything else. You have to be able to do, um, to, to do it all. And to John Harvey's very good point in his luncheon speech, there are a lot of events out there that we are not going to be able to predict, and we have to have forces that are agile, mobile, and hostile if necessary to respond to the various unexpected things that happen. It's, it's, it's the nature of the world. So who can make that happen? Does it take the president having to give a speech saying we're now going to direct this attention more to Asia, or is it SecDef, or is it Secretary of well, State, to, or how, how does that happen? Well, to some degree, it, it already has happened. Secretary Gates' speech at West Point a few weeks back uh, mentioned uh, in not so many words the idea that in the future, 
we might be putting less money into our land forces and somewhat more into our naval and air forces. And in my, in my own mind, that re represented a, a significant thing for the Secretary of Defense to have said, particularly given the views that he expressed in earlier speeches that he gave in various venues going back you know, two or three years to the earlier points during his tenure as Secretary of Defense. So for him to say that at West Point, I thought was a fairly significant marker uh, of where his own thinking on the issue now stands. Great. We have about 10 minutes. Uh, do we have a couple of questions from there? I think there are microphones, maybe microphones. Are there mics? Yes, people rising up. Please make your questions brief. And direct them to Admiral Keating. Uh, good afternoon, and thanks, thanks to all of you for a really great panel. Uh, David, I wish you hadn't made that comment about brief questions, because I've actually got four here. I just wanted to highlight them and let you pick the one I asked. But since I don't have time to Why do not? that. Why don't you make the pick for one, sir? I'll make the pick. Got the guidance. OK, uh, the one I'm going to go with is, uh, is what I call yin and yang. So you guys did a great job, I think, of teeing up the conflicts between core national interests in certain topics. My question is along these lines. Uh, if uh, First of all, I would posit that maybe human interests, human rights would be one of the core interests where we would we would benefit and they would benefit if they were to move more to our position. First part, part A is, is that the right posit? And part B is, what is a, a second core interest where we would be willing to move more to their position as a sort of a quid pro quo? Greg, since it worked. Yeah. Um, that's an interesting question. I don't know that in any of the currently articulated Chinese core interests that uh, we're mo willing to move any further toward uh, uh, their position. Tibet is one of their core interests. Uh, Tibet is... Uh, uh, certainly not an independent country, uh, part of China. Uh, China objects to uh, us hosting the Dalai Lama or even talking to him. Uh, the uh, Taiwan, as Tim said, is another core interest. Uh, we're, um, uh, we favor a peaceful resolution of the cross-strait issues, and that's about as far as we're willing to go on that one. Uh, Freedom of navigation, freedom of the seas, uh, what uh, Mr. O'Rourke talked about uh, with the maritime claims, uh, we're not uh, not willing to move much further on, on that um, than we have. We are very keen to make progress with China on those areas where we do agree. Uh, and if you're making progress on other areas, then those areas where you have disagreements are certainly much easier to handle than if that is allowed to become the only conversation. Thank you, sir. Okay. Thank you, gentlemen. Bob Ackerman with Signal Magazine. Uh, earlier, Mr. O'Rourke described how we defeated the Soviets in the Cold War with military, economic... Could you get a little closer to the mic? Please? Sure. We defeated the Soviets in the Cold War with military, economic, ideological, and cultural pressures. And throughout the conversation, you also mentioned how, in fact, uh, China has been working to add economic influence throughout the region. My question goes to the original title of the panel. Are the Chinese doing to us what we did to the Russians? Is the Middle Kingdom rising and the United States declining in terms of strategic influence in the Asia-Pacific region? I don't think so. Uh, in my experience, my conversations, my, I should say our experience, our conversations, our life out there indicate um, the situation as posed in the, in the title that you just ran through is not likely to happen in the near to midterm and, and by, by, keep, by continually advancing that, the, the difference between mid and far term where those situations remain favorable to us, we, we forestall any possibility that the situation you described will occur. I, we have sure. tremendous political capital out there in the region, but it is not inexhaustible. Right. We have to make sure to replenish it on a regular basis, daily, uh, if, if possible. One example, the youth of Micronesia 
uh, Guam, the Marianas, and Micronesia enlist in the armed forces of the United yeah. States at a rate not exceeded per capita anywhere in the United States. First response is, oh, it's the economy. It's not the economy. It's not just the economy. It is a deep-seated patriotism and high regard for the United States. And you can see this in every airport in the region where they have major size posters of the fallen of Micronesia. And uh, these are small island communities. Every combat death is a family affair, yet they still enlist and they still support the armed forces. It is the United States influence out there to lose. And this is why we need to be present out there and why that presence needs to be a productive presence. We need to be in as many places as we can and we need to be productive members of the communities when we're out there and, rep and, and thereby represent the best of what America stands for. One other item, our most westernmost territory is Guam. Their motto is, it's where America's day begins. Uh, Guam is in desperate need of infrastructure rehabilitation. We need to do this as a priority on the part of the United States for a simple reason. Tourists from every Asian nation visit Guam, and if we're going to have vi Asian visitors there to an American territory in the Western Pacific, we need to buff it up so it looks like what it means to be associated with the best of America rather than to be a place where uh, it's need in need of investment. Great. Yes, sir. One more? Yes, please. You didn't take that guy over there. Ah. Sir, go ahead. Yeah, Thank Michael you. Gabola, Department of the Navy. I, I've got uh, one, one question here for you, gentlemen. If, if not today, China will become the largest consumer on the planet. W what are your concerns with respect to a conflict erupting over natural resources, especially within Africa or the Middle East? Yeah, competition for resources. Yeah. It's not an insignificant concern. Yeah. Uh, you know, the, 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 as I ran through the list of things that might keep Hu Jintao awake at night, or when the red switch rings, what, what, what's, some, what's the action officer going to say, hey, we got trouble? Energy, environment, satisfying, the massive, you know, there are, I, I see all kinds of different numbers of how many new cars are introduced into the Beijing Metroplex weekly. Uh, their, their environmental challenges are, are monstrous. Those who have been to Beijing are, know exactly what I'm talking about. So protecting their free, unfettered access to the maritime domain is a overarching priority for the government of China. And there, is, there are many areas for us to cooperate and collaborate with them, uh, and we should seek those opportunities. That's actually a great question because it brings up uh, trends that are visible now uh, and going into the future. One is the, uh, is the increasing demand on energy resources. Another is the increasing demand on already critical freshwater resources, meaning the river systems from the Ganges to the Mekong to the Yangtze. Uh, another uh, is the predation of the fish stocks in the Pacific. Uh, rather than think of this as a binary U.S. versus China thing, there are a lot of problems that we need to help all the nations of Asia solve so that we don't create conflict that stems from resource shortages. And just to add to that uh, very quickly, three points, not necessarily specifically for a conflict scenario, but. Uh, China's economic growth is placing an increasing demand not just on oil but on a number of commodities and mm -hmm. is a source of upward price pressure on a number of world commodities which can affect our, our own economy and the prices that we uh, see for things here in the United States. Secondly, uh, China's desire for resource security is something that they pursue at least in part by going out and buying it. It's the mercantilist approach to uh, uh, resource security, and it's something that is fueling their overseas presence in any number of, of uh, countries around the world. And thirdly, uh, we had an incident last year as a part of uh, China's dispute uh, with the, uh, sh uh, the fishing boat that bumped into the Japanese mm -hmm. Coast Guard cutter over the maritime territorial dispute in the uh, East China Sea, uh, in which uh, China escalated uh, uh, and attempted to resolve the situation in its favor by some heavy-handed 
uh, diplomacy involving rare earth materials. And so uh, in that regard, resources came into play. Uh, in this case, something that China currently uh, has cornered the market on pending the development of of new uh, mines in the United States and elsewhere uh, in, in a way that showed that they are willing to play hardball with resources if they think that it can be used to gain an advantage in a situation that they're in. By new mines, you mean holes in the ground and not things that float in the water? And <laughs> new rare earth material uh, mining uh, operations. <laughs> thank you for the good questions. Yeah, both, and uh, thank you, gentlemen. As always, Mr. O'Rourke, General Admiral, thank you. Thank you.